munera Christi. It's a Latin phrase. Anyone know what it means? I kind of expected that. When I was in the seminary, whenever a priest or a professor would use a Latin phrase for something, I was like, dude, come on. We don't know what you're talking about. Use the English. Let's go. And now I've become the thing I hated. <laughs> But the reason that happens is because I've learned these things now in the Latin, and so I think of them by their Latin titles and not in their English titles, but the Munera Christi means the offices of Christ, and more uh, specifically, the threefold office of Jesus Christ, and that's his priesthood, his prophetic office, and kingly office. The priestly office is pretty simple. It's one we're familiar with, but what do priests do? They offer sacrifice. You see that in the Old Testament, you see it in the New, you see it through Jesus Christ. Now he offers his whole body as a sacrifice for us. So Jesus offers his body, he pours out the, his blood for us so that through his blood, through his wounds, we are healed and our sins forgiven. But priests also lead the people of God in worship. And so that's what Jesus does. He leads people in worship and he offers his life as a sacrifice for us. Prophetic office... Again, it's pretty simple, easy, I think, to understand. It's, it's why we read the gospel every week. Because we hear how, how Jesus preached and taught, how he preached to the Pharisees, how he taught the Israelites, and how he even preached to the Gentiles. That means everybody. How Jesus preached and taught everyone. And then the, finally, the kingly office. This is probably the most ambiguous one. Because by, oftentimes for us in our modern day conception of a king, we think of a royal leader, and you have that medieval concept of the people serve the king. That's not the type of king that Jesus is. Jesus flips it around. In his kingly office, he serves and leads his people. I came not to be served, but to serve. Right? That's what Jesus says in the Gospels. So his kingly office is how he goes out and he heals and he prays for and he sets people free from their captivity, from their chains to sin and addictions. His kingly office is manifested by his way of being a healing presence for people. The beautiful reality of our gospel is that Jesus looks at the crowds and his heart is moved with pity for them and he sees the just multitude and I think in that moment, he probably felt limited in a certain way by his incarnation, by the fact that he is a human being like us, and he knew that he needed help. He needed other people to help in the ministry. And so what does he do? Ask the masters and laborers for the harvest, and he calls, he equips, and he ascends the first priest, the apostles. He calls them and he sends them out. And pay attention to what he did. The first thing he does after he calls them is he gives them authority. In other words, he gives them his office, his priestly, prophetic, kingly office. And so he sends them out. And, and when he says at the very end of the gospel that he sends them to the, the lost sheep of Israel, that's the priestly office. The apostles are going out to invite people back into right relationship with God. He tells them they're going to preach. That's their prophetic office. And then he gives them the authority and power to heal. To heal people from their physical infirmities, to set them free from demonic oppression. Whatever it is, he gives them that authority. And so Jesus has called, equipped his first apostles to go out and to share his ministry as priest, prophet, and king. The question that comes up out of this, though, is... That's what Jesus did then. What is Jesus doing today? Does Jesus see the need today in his people? You know, I, when I was a, a freshman at Central Michigan University, I became friends with this young man. His, his name was Joe Bin. He was from China. And Joe Bin had never been to church before. He had never seen, he'd never been to a Christian church. He'd never been to any sort of religious church organization, service in his life. So I invited him to come with me to Mass. And when the Mass was over, Jobin would just sat there in his chair and he was paralyzed. And I was like, dude, you okay? 
And he says, what was that? And I explained to him the mass of what we do. And he said, I've never felt that much peace in my life. And I was just in awe, you know, of his first experience of just feeling God's peace in that one encounter of mass. But there are a lot of people like Job in. There are a lot of people that have not heard anything about God. There are a lot of people who have grown up in the Christian faith and have left the church and need people to go out and bring them back. The need is great. How many of you watch Jeopardy? I don't. (laughs) Probably shocks you, I'm sure. Uh, You know, my buddy, Father Colin, he is an encyclopedia of knowledge. So if you ever want to, like, test your skills, watch it with him, you'll be frustrated, I'm going to tell you. He knows everything. But if you've, you probably know where I'm going if if you watch the show, but recently on Jeopardy, there was a clue about the Our Father. Yeah, this is interesting. And the clue was, fill in the blank, our Father who art in heaven. Boom, you would all win. (laughs) The people, the three contestants were supposed to respond with hallowed. And all three of them just stood there with a blank stare and didn't know it. And I thought, wow. Now, I first kind of wanted to think, well, maybe they just got nervous. Like, these people answer all other questions. Like, they probably just don't know. How many people just don't know their faith? You know, I'm going to say this next thing. I promise not out of judgment, but out of a call to action. But, and, and with respect to the confidentiality of the confessional. But there are times when adults and teens, not just children come to confession, and I give them the Our Father as a penance, and they say, Father, I don't know it. If that's you, first of all, I love you. It's okay, but learn it. If there's one prayer we need to know, it's the Our Father. It's the one prayer Jesus taught us. We got to know it. We got to know that prayer. But there are a lot of people that just don't know their faith. The need is great. And then the the last example is the easiest one. Every person in this church, including me, all of us have some experience of suffering, whether that's physical, whether that's some mental, emotional thing that's going on, whether that's a divorce, whether that's some brokenheartedness. All of us have something, some experience of suffering. The need is great. And the question then is, what if anything is Jesus doing about it? Because if Jesus saw the need then and responded, he certainly sees the need now. And I believe he responds. But remember how he responded. He responded by calling and equipping his first priests, the apostles. Now, I could talk about the priesthood today, but I'm going to talk about the call of the baptized because this is something that we all share by our baptism. This is the prayer that I pray at, at a baptism, when, whether it's for adult or a baby, it doesn't matter, if I'm, as I'm anointing with the sacred chrism, which smells awesome. This is the prayer that I pray. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, has freed you from sin, given you a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, and welcomed you into his holy people. Christ now anoints you with the chrism of salvation, as Christ was anointed priest, prophet, and king. So may you live always as members of his body, sharing everlasting life. Just as Christ was anointed priest, prophet, and king, so are we. Jesus rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. That means the resurrected Jesus dwells with the Father in heaven. That means, Christians, that Jesus' hands and feet must be you today. See, Jesus sees the need, and he responds, but he responds through you, by you exercising your priestly, prophetic, and kingly office, by us exercising our priestly office by praying for and with one another, by us exercising our prophetic office by preaching and telling people how loved they are by God, by us exercising our kingly office by responding in loving service to the needs of those around us. 
if we want to make a difference, if we really want people to be convinced of Christ's presence in their life, it starts with us responding to the need and exercising our office as priest, prophet, and king.